Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizing uh, committee for the invitation to present the Kilodubek project to the symposium. I uh, think it's a project that's, that's kind of flown under the radar in the over the last uh, little while and, and has the potential to become an important development track project uh, in the near future if, uh, if everything pans out the way that we hope it would. Uh, I will be making some forward-looking statements through the presentation, so important just to, to keep that in mind, and in particular uh, with respect to uh, our inferred level resource estimate for the Q1 for Kimberlake. And I'm just going to uh, sort of reintroduce North Arrow Minerals uh, a little bit. We've been active in, in the North in the past, and, and uh, we're happy to be back here again. I'll take you through the history of the project and what our plans are for this year and try and give you some of the rationale for what it is that we want to try and accomplish and, and what uh, the possible outcomes might be from that work. Uh, North Arrow, we're a publicly traded company. We listed on the, on the Venture Exchange based in Vancouver. We reorganized the company uh, about 18 months ago to focus solely on diamond exploration opportunities in Canada. And we pulled together a group of people that in essence is the, the ex aber Resources team that was involved in the discovery of the Dialic Mine in the, in the Northwest Territories. So bringing together a group of people that have a, a history of successful uh, experience in the diamond space, both on the exploration side and, uh, and on the development side, in Canada and around the world. We married that with some significant financial backing and pulled together projects, uh, some a series of projects in Canada that we think uh, that all have uh, significant merit. We've also been active uh, in, in Nunavut in the past. Uh, North Arrow was actually formed as a northern-based exploration company. And, uh, and back in 2001-2002, uh, with Grant Thomas and myself, we were actually involved with what, I think at the time, and, and I think still uh, would, would qualify as a, the largest industry Aboriginal exploration agreement that we negotiated with NTI to explore uh, the Iowa lands in the West Katikinia. So we do have a number of projects. Uh, Kilbugek is our primary project and our most important one. We have two other pre-discovery stage projects in Nunavut that we'll be, uh, we'll be evaluating over the next several years at Lux and Mel. We also do have two projects in the Lac de Gras area uh, in partnership with Arctic Star and Dominion Diamonds. And then our, our most significant success last year, uh, as we first ramped out our, uh, our diamond exploration work, was at Piku in Saskatchewan, where we discovered a new field of diamond-bearing kimberlites in partnership with Stornoway Diamond Corporation. We're also in partnership with Stornoway in Ontario at Temiskaming and at Kilalugak. Kilalugak is, is a project that, that does have a history. It was originally the area was originally evaluated by BHP Diamonds in the turn of the, of the century. Um, they discovered a series of eight kimberlites just north of Repulse Bay. Uh, in 2003 and 2004, and the Q1 to 4 Kimberlite is the largest of those discoveries. And around 2006, Stornoway came on to the project as a partner, uh, and ultimately Stornoway acquired a 100% a interest as BHP made their exit from the diamond space. And then Stornoway has been very active after acquiring this project. They've uh, been primarily focused on developing the Renard mine in Quebec, and uh, whenever a project sort of gets to that point, typically it's the other exploration projects that suffer and don't see the funding that's required to move them forward. And that's where North Arrow comes in. We've uh, completed an agreement with Stornoway where we can earn an interest in, in the Kilowicz project by funding the collection of a bulk sample, uh, and we're going to be collecting that sample this summer. And I mentioned the Q1 to 4 Kimberlite as being the most, the most important uh, discovery that BHP made, and it's really pretty unique in a couple of ways. It happens to be the largest of the Kimberlites that BHP found in the area, and it was also the highest grade, which is a nice combination to have. And most importantly, it's also closest to the, the community of Repulse Bay and to Tidewater. The High Arctic has a history of successful mining development uh, for mineral deposits that are located on Tidewater. We think that's a huge advantage and a huge potential advantage for this project. And the fact that the, the Kimberley itself sits partly underneath this lake, and we'll, we'll look a little bit at the outline, but it sits right in this area. You can see the ocean in the background. It has a huge potential benefits when it comes to, uh, to working on logistics at the exploration side, but also for any potential mining development. And that was one of the really big positives that we looked at in, in taking on this project. The other was the size of the body. Q104 is a, a multi-phase, low-bait Kimberlite pipe. It, uh, at, at its size, it's just over 12 and a half hectares of surface area. And in uh, May of last year, we restated a, a resource estimate that had been completed by Stornoway so that we could consider its feed currents. And its uh, the overall body contains just over 48 million tons of Kimberlite at an average grade of just over a half carat per ton, and a total contained uh, resource of 26 million carats. And that, that uh, takes the body down to a depth of about 200 meters, uh, down about here, and then through the drilling, the, the deepest hole has tested the body to about 285 meters below the surface, so we've defined a target for further exploration that can see us at another 
15 or so million tons at a very similar rate down to 300 meters depth. So it's, it's quite large. And you can see here, which is also important, just the outline of the body. Part of it is underneath the small lake, and then part of it's on land. And that's, uh, that's something that we'll, we'll touch on as well moving forward. Just as a comparison, so we have this resource, and then what we looked at is, well, what, what does this mean? So this, this slide and then the next one just shows the Q1 to 4 resource as a comparison to other more advanced projects or, the, or operating mines, shown in red, uh, at the point where they went into production, just to give an idea of where this might sit. This is, uh, it's important to point out, uh, in many ways, comparing apples to oranges in that the Q1 to 4 resource is at the inferred level, so there's a lot less certainty in our numbers than there would be for these other projects. But the, the important takeaway is just to show that at, at 26 million contained carrots, carrots the, uh, the resource size is pretty big. It's good. There's a good number of, of diamonds there. And similarly, when we look at the overall grade at a half carat per ton, or just about 54 carrots per 100 ton, uh, the grade is pretty good too. It compares very favorably. Uh, and, and I would point out in particular to the Victor mine, Beers uh, mine in northern Ontario, as a, as a direct comparable in Canada for a remote diamond operation that's been successfully mined at a relatively low grade of about 26 carats per 100 ton. So overall, uh, we can look at the, the grade of Q1 to 4, we can look at the tonnage and say that, okay, we've got, we've got something substantial here. When it comes to evaluating kimberlites, of course, they are a little different than other metals deposits in that you come up with the tonnage and you can come up with the grade, but you need to know that third component, that so, third sort of leg of the stool, which is what are the diamonds uh, themselves worth. And uh, in order to do that, you need to have a, a large enough parcel of, of the stones. When we look at the current parcel of diamonds from Q1 to 4, we have about 64 carats that we can look at and try and evaluate. And what we can sort of characterize from what we see so far is that the diamonds look pretty good. They look like typical Canadian goods. And so in terms of what that means is, is you can look at Canadian production and the values range from in the neighborhood of $90 a carat up to over $500 a carat with where this project is located. I think if we're at the lower end of that range, then it's probably going to be pretty tough to see a development occur. But if we can get a valuation that's in the middle to high end of that range, then, uh, then this project could, uh, could start to look pretty interesting quite quickly. In addition to sort of looking at the overall parcel, then we're looking at, at wanting to get towards a higher valuation. And, and so then the question is, well, do we do, see anything that could be a bit of a sweetener or a bit of a kicker that might help this evaluation along? And that's where these guys come in. Uh, there is a population of yellow diamonds within the Q1 to 4 parcel. We, uh, we see these yellow stones uh, in all phases of the kimberlite. We've seen them in all size fractions of diamonds that have been recovered to date. They've been looked at by uh, Stornoway's Diamond Terrace. They've also been looked at by Tiffany's. And, uh, and they've been characterized as fully saturated yellow stones. And so if these diamonds then carry on into the larger sizes that we're going to see, larger diamond sizes that we'll see with a bigger sample, and if they have big crystal forms, they would be considered true yellow fancy diamond. This photo shows some of the nicer sort of regular commercial goods that we see in the parcel, but also just to point out, when it comes to the yellows, that there is a continuum <coughs> of colors that we see from these more paler yellows to some very, very deep colors. And it's these guys in particular that the diamond tears point to and say, if we can find some of these, then um, that, can, that can really have a very positive uh, uh, impact on the overall valuation. Which then leads to the question, okay, well, can we characterize what that positive uh, impact might be? And, and luckily for us, we have a, uh, a direct comparable that we can look to in the Ellendale mine in Australia. Ellendale produces about half of the world's yellow fancy diamonds at the moment. And, uh, and it happens to be, for Kimberley Diamonds, the operator, it's their only operating mine. And they also have a, uh, an offtake agreement with Tiffany, where Tiffany buys their yellow production. And so with all of those factors, we're able to sort of drill down into their financials and actually pull out what it is that Tiffany pays for the yellow diamonds that come from Ellendale right now. And in the first quarter of 2013, Tiffany paid almost $5,500 U.S. a carat for the, uh, the rough yellow production out of Ellendale. As a comparable, again, then, to the, I mentioned what the Canadian production sells for, which is a sort of that $90 to $500 carat range. So I think what you can take away from that is that you're looking at a, an order of magnitude higher price for uh, four fancy yellow diamonds if they're present. So that then allows us to uh, come up with sort of a generic model and say, all right, if you have a, a generic mining operation, what is the impact of that uh, population of yellow stones? And we have two models here, one where you have a mining operation where 5% of the production is from yellow fancies, and the other is where 10% of the production comes from a, a yellow fancy population. I'll, I'll just focus on the left side because that matches re relatively well with the proportion of stones that we see in the current Q1 to 4 parcel. And just attaching a regular uh, average price for, for 2012 for rough commercial goods in Antwerp, which was just uh, right around $140 a carat, 
uh, and we use the price of four thousand three hundred dollars for Ellendale because that's what they they received for the diamonds of 2012. The takeaway uh, really just becomes that from five percent of your production, you're getting almost two thirds of the overall value from the deposit, and you're getting a price per carat that's that's right in that sort of mid to high range that we, we'd like to see. So overall, that sort of takes us through the, the thought process of why uh, North Arrow became involved in this project and why um, we see the need and the, the obvious next uh, next step is to get up and collect a, a larger sample and get a large enough parcel of diamonds to get evaluation. So we're going to do that this summer, uh, starting as soon as things thaw out enough for us to get going. So we're roughly targeting the first week in July to get started. We're going to collect a 1,500 ton sample from the trenching exercise on the portion of the Kimberlake that's on land. We're going to sling out a little mini excavator fill up one ton mega bags and sling them to, uh, sling them to town uh, to ship the sample south for, uh, for processing. And uh, we're already seeing some of the benefits of being so close to town. Uh, we're only nine kilometers away from Reed Balls Bay. Our crew can stay in town. Our local hires are going to be able to sleep in their own bed at night as they're, as they're working on the project. So it's a really unique situation and a really unique uh, uh, opportunity in Nunavut just being, being so close. Just looking at the logistics of collecting the sample, uh, one obvious question is, think is, well, can we do this? One, one of the things that we point to is the fact that Stornoway collected 20 tons by uh, using shovels by hand in 2008 from two pits. Where the Kimberlite is at surface, there's very little till cover. The one pit was a little bit deeper. There was about a meter of till and then down into the rock. And the other pit, there was, there was essentially no till at, at all on top of the pit and we were able to start digging up Kimberlite right away. We're going to focus collection of the sample in this area, but the fact that they're able to collect the, basically that sample by hand gives us comfort that we're going to be able to do this with a little mini excavator. When we look again at the location, just a, just nine kilometers to town, um, the outline of the body here, we're going to be focusing where we are on land, and uh, this, this slide shows the extent of the, the trench that we're going, to, we're going to try and dig. Basically it's an area about 20 meters by 30 meters. Maybe it'll be two different trenches, maybe it'll be one large one. We're going to have to kind of feel our way as we start the sampling exercise. You can just see the green dots are the pits that were that were collected by Stornoway. Obvious question becomes, well, that's that's one area from what's a very large pipe, and are we sure that that's going to be representative, and does it make sense to collect the sample from from this spot? So, we think it does make sense for the level of evaluation uh, of the Kimberlite and where we're at right now. Um, as we touched on, it is a multi-phase body, but the sample itself, so just go ahead. the sample itself is is going to be collected from this brown uh, phase of the Kimberlite here. This is a, a classic Kimberly uh, type pyroclastic Kimberlite phase. It's one of three phases, uh, the green, the purple, and the brown that are of that type. From a modeling perspective, the diamonds from those, from those phases all look very similar. The parcel looks identical. Um, and, and from a modeling perspective, they were treated the same in the current resource. They all have the same grade. There's two hypervisal phases that have, one has a slightly uh, lower grade, one has a slightly higher grade. But overall, the grade is relatively consistent across the body. And we also went through a modeling exercise looking at grade variation with depth in 100 meter slices. So the top 100 meters, uh, the, the, from 100 to 200 meters, and then even down into the target for exploration. And there's very little grade variation as we go uh, down to depth. And as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to the yellows, their, their presence in the, uh, in the Kimberlite is very consistent as well. They, they occur in all phases of the Kimberlite and in all sizes of diamonds that have been covered. And all of that leads us to, to, uh, to believe that, yeah, for for the level of evaluation we're at right now, we just want to get 500 carats of diamonds to get a taste of, of what the uh, what the value might be, so it makes sense to collect it in sort of the, the quickest, uh, least disruptive, uh, and, and least expensive manner possible. So we're going we're to collect it uh, from the, that one one area. So, so a nine kilometer flight from a uh, sample location uh, down to town to a spot so about a kilometer north of town, uh, where we have a lay down area. We have some fuel park there right now. We'll be uh, parking the sample bags in this, uh, in this spot. And then at the end of August, when the annual sea lift arrives, we'll truck the sample down. And over about a four day period, we're going to load the uh, sea lift up and ship the sample uh, south to, uh, to Montreal for processing. In terms of, uh, of reclamation of the site, again, we have no camp, which is great. All the overburden will get stripped off. We'll collect the trenches down. We're only expecting to dig down about a meter into the Kimberlite to give us the sample size that we need. The overburden will be backfilled, recontoured, we can bring out members of the community, make sure everybody's happy with how it's gone. We sling the excavator out, and it's, it's sort of a, and then we're done with it. And we, we sit and we wait for the uh, the ultimate results on on processing the sample. So, in terms of, uh, of timing, we'll be collecting the sample through July and August, shipping the sample south, and ideally, it's arriving at the laboratory in Thunder Bay in uh, in late September or early October, and over 
over a three-month period, we'll process the sample so that in, in January or February, we have our parcel of diamonds and, uh, and we're getting it valued in, in Antwerp, very similar to the process that uh, the Peregrine just went through for Chitliac. And then, uh, ideally, uh, I'll be back here this time next year with a, with a number that we can plug in here. And then we'll have all three components that, uh, that we need to uh, see if this, uh, if this project is going to move forward or not. And we can move forward with the process of completing a, uh, a preliminary economic assessment, looking at some of the economic parameters for a potential mine development in this area. So that's it. All this we think we can get done for uh, just, just shy of $4 million. And, and again, I can't say enough that that, that price tag we think is, is just quite reasonable. It totally makes sense to be doing this program right now to see if this thing can move forward. If the value is there, this really quickly becomes a development track project. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, with Stornoway this year. And, uh, and we're looking forward to, uh, to getting the program done. And, and uh, fingers crossed, everything goes well. We'll have some good news this time next year.